to the third, to the third and the last uh, day of the workshop. And we are happy to have Lucas Miller and he will tell us about anomalies, high geometry and functorial field series. Uh, one second. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. So yeah, I'm going to talk about anomalies and then I try to talk a bit about the corresponding mathematics one can use to study it. And uh, a lot of these things have already appeared in previous talks. So this section three will be mostly about boundary theories and section two to about certain kind of geometric aspects and then section four is something which where most of my own work actually lies and then the project is studying a really simple example of these things of distant cases. But I will start with some physical motivation and anything which is my own work in this process based on those work with which I start and then go on. Yesterday we have seen and then we thought we have seen along these in the opacity for a description. And in my talk, I will focus on the kind of coordinate description. So, how can we see the map the length of, of space spaces and box spaces? So, I will start with some uh, sigma physical motivation. Uh, so, um, physics. Um, so, I'm drawing a moment here to pick the pick space, not the space, but pick the space. And then to set up our front heat theory. Uh, we usually need some geometric structures on N. And to be concrete, I will also so here I will come out like the general story. And on the right, I will talk about the chiral anomaly of day series. So we have a total description. This happens if the dimension of N is uh, odd. So it's more uh, equal to, to one, more not equal to two. And then the case we have. Based on the list of the metric, which I was given to the Riemannian on a um, uh, gauge field. So, this is a connection on the principal bundle for G to G. And furthermore, the representation of G, the representation of G, the bundle. And then the last thing we have is a split structure. Lucas. Lucas. Yeah. Is your microphone on? It's supposed to be, yes. Yeah. Okay. How's the sound? Okay. So is it better now? Someone should respond. <laughs> yeah. Is our microphone on? So well, we have to have this. Um, uh, this one. Uh, there's a lot of echo. I mean, I can turn this microphone off. Should we do some testing? Is it better? Or? Maybe you, can you try just this? I can turn this off. This is not supposed to be muted. And um, is it better now? Speaker Mick is not configured as input. Is there a problem? Are we use the same setup. Okay, I don't know. I mean, if you can hear me now, I would just continue. Um, People seem to hear you through that microphone. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, so where was I? Uh, yeah, so this is somehow the geometric background structure we need to define a chiral gauge theory on a uh, time slice. And over here, we just have a manifold M and then some type of geometric structure on which lives in the space F of M. And then what we get, what one has first, one has a one particle Hilbert space. Okay, so one has some H. And here, this H is going to be given by the square integral sections of the Spino bundle tensor with the vector bundle, which is induced from the principal bundle at this representation row. So these are sections, square integral sections of the Spino bundle. 
And then this is like a one particle Hilbert space. And then what one wants to do is second quantization. And for this, one needs to pick a polarization of the Hilbert space. So decomposition into positive and negative. So into an H plus and an H minus. And then one can define the second quantized fourth space on M as the exterior algebra on H plus and wrought with the exterior algebra on H minus. And here, so if the, um, let's assume for the moment that there are no zero modes for the Dirac operator, then we just take S H plus all eigen, the space span by eigenvectors with positive eigenvalues and H minus being the space span with um, negative eigenvalues. And if there are zero modes, you can, for the moment, you can just put them into H plus or into H minus, and the resulting Fox spaces will be isomorphic but non canonically. But since we are just at one point in F, we, this is not, not such a big deal. The problem appears now if we study the following we, if we try to understand what happens if we vary these Hilbert spaces over F, F of M. So we want to understand the dependence. On f of m, and this is the place where the anomaly happens. So it's like somehow that we cannot define this fog space globally uh, or continuously in the space based on the space of fields. So what we can try to do is we can cover f of m with some patches uh, ui and uj, and then we hope that we can pick some polarizations over these patches, patches so that we can smoothly define these, these Hilbert spaces. So then we will get a ZI of M defined on, on um, this open patch, and we will get a ZJ of M, which is defined over the, the other open patch here. And as an example, what one can do in the Tyler gauge series, so for example, if I have my, my my patch, and then the spectrum of the Dirac operator does something like this. I could, um, like, for example, in the I patch, I could say the I, and then this bit here would be J. So, and then I just take H plus everything above this uh, element, which is not in the spectrum, and here I take everything below the element, which is not in the spectrum. But maybe. I mean, there's no reason why I can do this consistently over all of f of m. I mean, there's a reasonable hope to be able to do this locally, but globally, there might be no reason for this to work. And this is exactly uh, where the anomaly comes from. So it's like the fact that we are not able to pick these polarizations consistently. So, but now let's assume that. Uh, I can at least relate the polarizations uh, by something kind of dimension. So I assume Hj is Hi plus some finite dimensional vector space. And I mean, this is what happens here, right? The finite dimensional vector space are just all modes between these two uh, values. So if I have this. And then H minus. I will be H minus J plus the same space. Here is some W of J. And now I can consider the form spaces. And uh, from the definition, uh, we see more or less directly that this space is not equal to the other one um, in this case, but we have a canonical isomorphism, which goes to the IM. If we tensor with the determinant of W of J. The determinant is just the top exterior power. And since this is happens like over Uij, and if Uij is non contractible, this might define a, a non trivial line bundle. But we could even make it, I mean, if we assume that we have a good cover, this we could trivialize this. But the thing is that this trivialization is non canonical. This will later on again. This is where the problem lies somehow. And then here on the Cairo gauge theory side, I mean, Wij is just the eigenspaces with eigenvalues between 
like theta uh, i and so um, okay and now we can ask what happens on triple intersections uh, so if i go look at the triple intersection u i j k what i will find is that um i mean i can start with the i this is isomorphic to the j tends to the determinant of w i j I can also directly go to the k, and I need to tender with the determinant of w um, i k, and here I can now go to the j at the k, and then I tender with two determinants, and it turns out that there's a canonical map here, which is of the form one tender with some psi i j k, um, which um, is a map from the determinant ij tends with jk to um, the determinant for wik. So this is phi i. Okay. So we this and now, somehow here you can just spell this out, but this will give you a similar structure. And now this is somehow really where the anomaly happens is that we cannot trivialize these things and these things at the same time. So there's somehow no globally well defined Hilbert space on FM in general, uh, but it's only defined locally. And then these things somehow encode the failure of it being a Hilbert space. So let me now. Uh, try to motivate the corresponding mathematical structures. So we see what I really want to highlight are for the moment these two bits. Um, and I want to like convince you that you think of these things as line bundles, but where the coefficients are not complex numbers, but actual vector spaces. So you see here, like I have at the intersection of two things, I give a, uh, I give a vector bundle. For a line bundle here, I would give, um, so if I have a line bundle, I would give some transition function from uij to c cross. But here I give a vector bundle, which is a smooth, which is a map from uij to vector spaces, but the smooth family of vector spaces. And then down here, I have the usual cosine condition fij, fjk. Equals S I K. But since these are vector bundles, there's a notion of map between them. So I don't want to have the co cycle condition as an equality, but I want to have it as an isomorphism. So I have an isomorphism here, which implements the co cycle condition. And then there's a compatibility condition on uh, quadruple overlaps, which I'm not going to mention. No, I'm not going to spell out, but you can, can figure it out by just looking at the example, opening any textbook. And so this structure I motivated it like a category fine line bundle, or these things are also known as jerks. So this is the structure one gets. So we have the space of fields. Um, move to the other side. Yeah, so we have the space of fields. Uh, f of n, and then we have this higher geometric structure of a jerk sitting over it. And now, if you look what this z does, this behaves like a section because it defines like something on all the independent patches, which then transforms if I go from one patch to the other one by the transition functions. Now, just we implement these things by the morphisms again. So we have our um, jerk sitting over f of n. And then we have the Hilbert space uh, is very defined as a section of this jerk. And the non triviality of the jerk is similar, is the presence of an anomaly. Okay, let me mention what happens in the Kyra case. So we take now uh, only, we only vary, so we restrict the space to the space of uh, connections on a fixed bundle. And this is an affine space over one forms on M with values in G. And then I have a jerk over here. And this thing is called the index jerk. Uh, so this has been studied by uh, 
uh, carry Nicholson and Murray in the connection to our normal leaves. And uh, the Hilbert space is again a section here. Uh, and now the anomaly is the non triviality of the job. But one really needs to be careful because this is a contractible space. So you probably know that our line bundles over contractible space are trivial, but the same is true for jobs. So the job as its own is trivial, and the anomaly really comes from the fact that there's, a, there's more structure, right? There's the group of gauge transformations acting here. And this job, the job here becomes equivariant with respect to this action. And really the anomaly is a non-triviality of this equivariance. And this is the second point I want to make in this introduction is somehow these things are higher geometric objects, but it's important to also treat this thing as a higher geometric object, which has internal symmetries. So here you see if it's just difficult to just treat it as a space and do not consider the gauge transformations, it's really there's no anomaly. And the anomaly comes from the non, non equivariance, uh, from the non or from this thing being not equivariantly trivial. Okay. And then there's another technical problem we might worry about is that these things are infinite dimensions, of course. I mean, this space is in general infinite dimension, and this one as well. So now I'm, the next bit I want to talk about is just like a mathematical framework, somehow which allows us to make these objects precise and talk about them and study them. So this is um, goes under the name higher geometry. Um, which is actually two, okay, which is part two of my talk. So let me start with a definition of a generalized space. Space um, is a pre sheet uh, F on the side of manifolds, which takes values in infinity groupoids or simply sets or topological spaces. And this is similar to what we have seen in then Fried's talk yesterday, modeling the geometric structure we put on a border category. But for the moment here, we allow more than just um, local diffeomorphism. We also allow all maps of the Fried Smith manifold. And um, then we also denote by H as a category of generalized spaces. Let me give you some examples. So how does this framework come on quotes most of uh, geometry you probably know. The first example is we fix a manifold X. Uh, so this is a manifold. It can even be a Fichet manifold or some other infinite dimensional type of manifold. And then we can form a generalized space. that just goes from manifolds up to, to the two sets. But this sits in uh, infinity group points. So these are just the group points with no higher morphisms. And what does this chief do? It just sends a manifold M to the collection of C infinities so of smooth functions from M into X. And this somehow should be the general picture one has in mind for these objects. So instead of describing the space S, what we really describe is what it means to have a smooth family of points in F parameterized by a manifold M. And this is somehow a convenient way of modeling all types of higher spaces. So let me also give you two more examples which have some higher structures or which are relevant to what is going to come. So the first one is uh, BG with a connection. This sends a manifold M to the groupoid of G bundled on M with connection. And then the other example is um, related to the fact that we want to uh, also study like geometric structures on a field on a fixed manifold. So I fix some manifold X, and then I want to have like a space which describes certain geometric structures on X. And usually you do that by parameterized geometric structures on fiber bundles, with typical fiber X. So let me just. This is an example which are metrics in, on a fixed space X. So they send M to a set of fiberized metrics on um, on M cross X. So 
to the projection to X. I should also say putting many folds here is not, it's a bit too big because in general, these things satisfy descent. So they are already determined by knowing them on like contractible space. So one could also replace this with like the category of Cartesian spaces or so. Um, so you're using a sheet condition in general. So. Uh, did I say that? It's a sheet. This should be a sheet, yeah. So it satisfies the version of descent. And this allows you instead to work with sheets on Cartesian, uh, Cartesian spaces. Which is a bit smaller, but uh, somehow these manifolds they really have a good interpretation. So we will stick to it for the moment because we are not going to do anything too technical, anyways. Uh, so now, Lucas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you would you need the bundles m times x to be non-trivial if you want to have a sheaf? Um. I don't think so. I'm not 100% sure. I was confused about that when I was preparing the talk as well. But I think it's, I mean, these are just, I mean, what I want to write is something like maps from M into metric on G, uh, uh, metric on, on X. But I want to write this. And I could put like some manifold, infinite dimensional manifold structure on this. Um, and then I could use an adjunction to rewrite it as maps like this. Um, and, and the projection should be to M or to X? Oh, the projection should be to right? M. Yeah, That's okay. correct, yeah. So I, I wasn't, I'm not 100% sure, but I thought, I think this is okay. Because somehow I do not allow automorphisms of X. So nothing happens. Like if I would also somehow include diffeomorphisms of X, then I would need bundles because then I can like locally glue using these different morphisms of X and this would not. Be ah, okay, true. okay, thank you. I mean, if someone disagrees, so they should let me know. Uh, okay, so now, now I'm like, I don't want to call this a definition, but now somehow higher geometry is just you do ordinary geometry, but you replace manifolds with generalized spaces. So we can do we define what a smooth higher group is. So a smooth higher group is an element G in H. What I should say is a group object in an H, but um, I'm just going to give you an informal definition. So it's an object in here which comes with a multiplication which goes from G cross G to G, and it has a unit. It is a map from the constant sheet. And these things now need to satisfy. So there's a lot of coherence data, which encodes that this thing is associative and this is a unit. And furthermore, this needs this multiplication needs to be invertible, which where you can more or less use the same definitions one uses usually. And then so I'm not as I say, I'm not going to give you all the details because in H it's also quite complicated, but quite often. The things we have actually factors through sets or the factors through group points, and in there it's easier to say what these objects are. So let me give you two examples. So the first one is just I take a leaf group and then I take G underline. So I take, consider this as a smooth, as a generalized space, and this is a smooth group. So this is one example. And then the second example, which is relevant to define jobs. Uh, I call line, but you could also call this B C cross if you want. And this sends the manifold M to the um, two point of line bundles on M. And here I only take invertible morphisms. So it's two is by M to manifold M, it assigns a scoop point of line bundles and the multiplication. In this case, it's given by taking the tensor product of line bundles, and all line bundles are invertible with respect to this operation. Okay. And now there, so now we have groups, and now there should there's a similar definition to to the usual case of a principal bundle. So this was definition is due to Nicolaus, uh, Stevenson, and Schweiger, and. I'm, again, I'm not going to give you the details or any precise definitions, 
but um, it's similar to what you would expect. So it's a, it's a generalized space which comes in with a map down to your original space, which has an action of G such that the quotient of the principal bundle by this action is uh, X. And then a job on X in H is uh, a line. So this is like a really bad material. Okay, let me write B C cross. Cross bundle. And you see, if you now imagine something like a co cycle description for this, then on double intersections, you will actually assign line bundles. And on triple intersections, you will need to assign isomorphism. So, this is somehow a good mathematical framework to make the things we had, uh, we have seen before, precise. And also, this X, as I alluded to here, can be infinite dimensional. This is not, not a big problem for this framework to have. The, at least on a theoretical level, I would say. Uh -huh. And let me do one example. So I can look, I take a manifold X, which has an action of a, of a leak group, and I can define this portion step. Uh, and this, um, so I'm only going to say to you what it does locally. So if I evaluate this on a patch, I don't know, on something contractible or something local, I get P infinity functions from you into X, X is on with the infinity functions of U into G. And then the global behavior can be constructed by gluing these things together, just using the descent construction. If you do this on a global manifold N, this would not be a sheaf, but you can chiefify uh, this description. And then let me put this here. So if I have a job on, on this, Space, then this is, this is equivalent to having uh, a G equivariant job on, on X. And this is exactly what we have seen in the beginning. Right? We had this job at uh, the space here, which actually is a quotient stack. So I have a space, I have an action of the group. And then if I want to have a job on this as a higher geometric object, I actually need to give an equivariant job on here. And this is exactly what happened in that work. Um, okay, now I will switch topics a bit and move towards functorial field theories. And the goal is somehow to at least sketch how this modern description of anomalies in terms of functorial field theories actually matches this older description. And what type of mathematical connections one expects for these things to match up. And should also say there are a lot of things which are open, in my opinion. Uh, so this is three and section three. And the new thing compared to some of the previous talks is that my field theories will actually be smooth. So as before, we define field theories as a functor from a borderism category equipped with geometric structures. Now this F is slightly different to the Fs over here. It only needs to be defined on families of n-dimensional manifolds and local diffeomorphisms between them. So it does not need to be defined on all manifolds. So for example, if n is two, one might want to consider spin R structures, which are certain double covers of, of uh, SO2, which do not exist in another dimension. So this would then be something which is really specific for dimension two. But otherwise, this F is really similar to what we have seen before. And um, also this appeared yesterday. And then it's a functor from this vector spaces. But now the new thing is that this is actually the symmetric monoidal. This is what we had before. But it's also supposed to be smooth. Symmetric monoid is smooth. Uh, and then, I mean, depending on what we want, this is really a smooth infinity category, but this smooth one category, so we can work with one category. And let me explain uh, what this word smooth means. So we just apply the same strategy as we did in the case of generalized spaces. To make something smooth, we just consider it as a chief on manifold of. So the smooth category is a factor from the opposite of manifold. Two categories. 
asymmetric monoid categories or symmetric monoid categories. And then what do I mean by the smooth category of vector spaces? Um, this is just sense n to the category of vector bundles on M. So the vector bundle on M is somehow a smooth family of uh, vector spaces. And the definition of the border, smooth border category is a bit more complicated. I should also, by the way, mention some names. So this idea of smooth field theories goes back to Stolz and Teichner. But then recently there have been precise definitions in the framework of smooth infinity n categories by Grady and Pavlov, and also a bit still in the case of yeah, smooth two categories by uh, Ludovic and Stolz. Um, but I'm not going to give you a precise definition, I'm just going to give you a sketch. So I need to de define all these um, categories here, uh, evaluated on a manifold. We allow infinite dimensional vector spaces. Um, let me not mention that. There are examples where you should, but then you should also worry about topology. Yeah. So I would like, like it depends on what you want to do, yeah. but generally you should, yeah. And maybe you also don't want to have like vector space, you don't want to have something like a sheet of vector space. Or something. This is like, yeah, depends on the example you have on mind. Uh, then you need to worry about what type of topology or hidden space, so whatever, so not. I would like to be agnostic about that. Um, but let me sketch this category to the object. Um, I mean, so this is just a parameterized version of the ordinary borders and category you have seen before. So an object is a fiber bundle of n minus one dimensional manifold, uh, or maybe germs of n minus one dimensional manifold and n dimensional manifold, which are equipped with fiber wise F structures. So this just means on every fiber I have, have something in it. So for example, it's something like the fiber-wise matrix we had seen before, or fiber-wise orientations. And then the morphisms are given by coordinates of these things. So I have a vector bundle of, uh, I have a fiber bundle of manifold, I have a different fiber bundle of n minus one dimensional manifold, and then I have a fiber bundle of coordinates over. Uh, over M, and this is uh, equipped with a, with a geometric structure. So this is one type, and then there, which one might need to add by hand or uh, in the framework. So I just want to highlight them explicitly the automorphisms of the symmetries of um, F of Y. So, for example, if um, if F contains the bundle, then these automorphisms would contain fiber by gauge transformation. So these are also morphisms in this board in category. Where is the over here? Ah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Now, smooth field theory is such a functor, but what, what, what does it explicitly? Like, if I have such a Z and I evaluate it on a, a such a smooth family of coordinates um, over S, what this will give me is first of all, it will give me two vector bundles over F. And then it will give me a linear map between them. So it will give me fiber by linear map between them, which corresponds to the uh, coordinate. Okay, now an example of which is actually a theory to uh, Derek Evans, Park, and Pavlov, and then a more modern version of a more modern proof is due to Ludwig and Stoffel. They also, their formulations are slightly different, and their proofs are different. But the theorem is that if I look at this one dimensional border in particular, with so here the structure maps into a target space X. Then smooth field series like this are equivalent to uh, vector bundles of this connection. 
uh, finite, they, they need to be finite dimensional here. Um, and how does this work? So an object in here is a, is a map from a point to X. So this will be mapped to the side of the X. Or more generally, an object in here is like a family of points in X, which will be mapped to the pullback of the bundle. And then a morphism in here is a cobordism. So it's like something like this, which comes with a map to X. And this will, map, will be mapped to the parallel transport. Uh, in the from the x to the y, and these are all these three theories. Okay. Now I want to explain how anomalies are described in this. And when we already have seen that yesterday it's by using relative theories or boundary theories, but to capture the uh, Hamiltonian part I mentioned before, I need to extend once. So I will uh, just define extended field theories by putting n minus two here and a two back there. Let me explain what the smooth category of two vector spaces is. Spaces is so um, two vector, and I just tell you what it does locally on a um, on like a contractible space, and then you can again extend it using a sheaf property. This is now two categories. So this. I think will be a smooth two category. The bordism category will also be a smooth two category where we just allow now objects are n minus two dimensional vector bund uh, fiber bundles. Morphisms are, are the same, and two morphisms are like fiber bundles of uh, the fiber bundles of cobordism between cobordism. I mean, defining these things explicitly is uh, not that easy. This is like the picture one should have in mind. In this category locally, it has as objects. Algebra bundles. These are bundles of algebras uh, on U. Uh, then the morphisms are bimodule bundles. And the uh, two morphisms are just fiber wise linear maps of bimodule bundles. And this is the local description, and then the global description happens by gluing the algebra bundles together by micro bundles. And this has recently been started, studied by Crystal, Ludovic, and Waldorf. So I should mention that as well. And then, such a smooth field theory, once extended, we then assign an algebra bundle. Yeah. So these things, then, on the level of object, these things will be algebra bundles, these things will become by micro bundles. Um, So you now, if I want to describe an anomalies, they are described the anomaly itself. So the, the interpretation here is that they are actually described by field series. The anomaly itself is a field theory, uh, but it's inverted with so it lands like in the two line bundles and isomorphisms between them. And then if I want to describe uh, and the, uh, yeah, the norm theory with our normally is the relative field theory, and they can be described by uh, either relative field theories or twisted field theories. For this, I take this A and I restrict it to its value on n minus one and minus two, and I allow like the things which are symmetries of, of the uh, geometric structure. So this. And I think yesterday this was called the category fight. Uh, field theory or something like that. And then I have this function here, two, two line numbers, and I have a trivial one, and I have the restriction of A. So can, I can restrict my A to this category. And then a relative field theory is defined as a natural transformation fitting on this. Uh, and this is the so symmetric monoid. And uh, it's lux, but the lux does not is with respect to the symmetric monoidal structure, but it's with respect to the coherence isomorphisms for the two naturalities. So it's the lux symmetric monoidal two transformation, and it also needs to be smooth. So everything to work in 
families over manifold and these large uh, transformations they have be, been defined quite generally by Scheinbauer and Johnson fight for infinity and categories okay and now I want to somehow connect this description of a field theory to what I mentioned before and the point here is um, this description somehow considered all allowed manifolds at the same time so we study really Quantum field theory is not just on the fixed space or space time manifold, but on all series we can put it on. And this definitely contains more information. And there are even situations where these things might be trivial on, on the independent manifolds, but they interplay non trivial. So this is more general, but how do we go back to the more classical description? For this, we fix some space time at some space. Um, this is an n minus two dimensional manifold. And then we want to somehow take this anomaly field theory and restrict it to the space. Time. And the way of doing this is um, called or the version of dimensional reduction. So I consider this category. And I'll look at geometric structures on sigma as my, my geometric structure on the two, one, zero border category. And I can map this into the um, n, n minus two border category. And how does this work? So I take an object in here or a manifold in here, and this comes with a geometric structure. It is an element in F of sigma evaluated on S. So this means it's like somehow S parameterized uh, family of uh, geometric structures on sigma. So this is also something which will live be contained in this will define in this structure on sigma cross s so then i just map this to s for sigma equipped with this geometric structure but seen as living in here and i can use this to take this field theory and restrict it to the sportism category and i can also restrict these relative field theories so i get then i get relative field theories on this uh, Type of borders and categories. And now the connection to um, uh, the previous description is um, the following conjecture, which is definitely not due to myself, but I'm also not sure which name to put here. And it's, I would also say it's probably in the way I formulated it's wrong, but it should be morally true. So. Like it will be true in certain cases, and then if one finds the right interpretation of the word, it will be true in general. And I will say a bit more about what this failure is of a topological case in a few minutes. Because I have so which is invertible, it goes to two vector spaces. And the statement is that these things are equivalent to jobs on F sigma with the dimension. This is somehow what one expects if the two descriptions of anomalies in physics, like the two mathematical ways of describing anomalies in physics, if they match up, then these two things should also match up. And furthermore, the relative field theory Z is equivalent to a section. Uh, and then one should probably put some additional adjectives on the field theory, like reflection positive or unitary or something. This is like, this is more like a general guiding principle of what should be true. And sometimes it might be true uh, directly or not. And I should also here mention that if you take a target space, here, so you take maps into a target space, then the connections to jerks on target spaces uh, it's ongoing work by Bunk and Waldorf, and they also have already done a lot of work on the non extended case. So there's like really good uh, hope that these type of field theories at least have something to do with jobs. Uh, and since I also have not mentioned generalized cohomology at all yet, um, these are, I mean, because these things are invertible, but then they're also fibered over, I mean, they're functors, she's on manifold. So if one looks at the invertible case, one will get a Chief of spectrum manifolds, and these are things we can study in differential homology. Um, 
complex. Let me mention one physical thing one can do with this description, which is the bike boundary correspondence. So if I have a manifold M, which has a boundary sigma, and M is now of dimension N. So if we got out, yeah, let me say something else before, because we got out, okay, I have this A, it's defined on N dimensional manifold. And this description, I don't need it. And then the version of twisted field theories by Stolz and Heitner, they also just have a twist, which is not defined on N dimensional manifold. But having the theory defined on N dimensional manifold really gives us additional data. And it's, it's safe for to study the theory. And the bike boundary correspondence is one example. So the relative field theory gives me a map form one if I evaluate it on the sigma to A of sigma. And then I can take the theory A and evaluate it on M. This will go back to one. And then here I will get an automorphism of the monoidal unit of, um, of two vector space. So I will get a vector space. For, depending on the family, I would get a, a vector bundle. So this is. Um, and this is the vector space, and this is like the by boundary space. And then there's one proposition one can do uh, in this framework, or at least in the non smooth framework, um, that uh, symmetries, the symmetries on this combined system of the theory, they act on this by boundary space and non projectively. And usually if one has an anomaly, like if I consider this as a state space, the action of the symmetries would be only projective. But if on this space, I will always get abstractly a non-projective action of the symmetry. Okay. And now in the last 15 minutes, um, I will discuss a simple toy model. Uh, so, the first simplification, simplification we will make is now that we don't work with um, smooth objects anymore, but we restrict to topological ones. And this makes our life, um, like, this makes a lot of things easier. And let me mention how the topological world is um, connected to the, um, to the smooth world. So I can take my generalized spaces. This is a sheaf on manifold. So I can evaluate at a point. And then I get a topological space, or I get an infinity group, or which I can model as a topological space. And this has a left edge joint, which will send the topological space somehow, makes it constantly as a constant, um, as a constant generalized space. And the same is true in the case of smooth infinity categories. So I can take one and evaluate it at a point. Uh, I just take the infinity category or topological category and make it constantly into a smooth category. And then somehow I say my bordism category is uh, topological, or the geometric structure is topological with board NF equivalent to taking this constant thing on like a topological category, which is the bordism category. Yeah. Um, and then using the junctions, we can actually rewrite a field theory on here as like a just a functor between categories out of this. Um, okay, and then in this case, also the definition of a jerk just becomes simpler. So if I look at a flat jerk, in all jerks will be flat, this is just so that we have a connection on C ordinal space. This is equivalent to having. Uh, a local system on T with values in, in two line bundles, so this goes to two line. And these are really now invertible um, algebras in this back case because this is now, this is not a smooth category anymore. This is just, just an ordinary two category. And such a functor is called a local system. Okay, now in this case, in the topological case, we can use the cobordism hypothesis. To study, to study the conjecture here, and what does it tell us? It tells us essentially, if I look at invertible field series from this bordism category, let's say with maps into a target space, in fact, uh, 
and it's convertible, and this is equivalent to a local system on T with values in um, orientable TFTs. So this then would plus an orientation. Um, and in here, I have two one zero. In here, I have the trivial ones which are given by this two line force. So this is in here, and the job, like this local system in here, the job would be the thing which comes from these, these type of things. Uh, and then here it's also clear what goes wrong with the conjecture over here. If my um, if my geometric structure includes an orientation, it's somehow more than that such a local system because it's twisted by the um, by the ON action on the category of on the fully dualizable object. So this was a lot of abstract stuff. Now I want to do something extremely simple. Which are, or not exactly something where one can do a lot of things explicit, I should say. So we, and these are these discrete gauge series. So we fix a finite group T, a uh, finite group D, and then we want to build a gauge theory in dimension N out of it. I should also say these have first been studied by Dijkhoff and Witten, and a lot of things I'm going to tell you are based on a paper by Fried and Quinn. These have been studied in the 90s. But somehow you can study this framework in this uh, yeah, in this case, where you can make some precise techniques. I want to explain. And then the action is given by an n. So I want to build an n-dimensional gauge theory with this finite uh, structure group. So the action is given by an n cycle in D D with values in D one. And now there are two field theories one can define. The first one is the classical one. So this is defined on cobordisms, which are oriented n dimensional. For so so this talk, I just extend down to n minus two, but the theory can be defined as something fully extended. Um, and this goes, this is invertible, this goes to two vector. And now this is not smooth. This is really just algebra, bimodules and bimodule maps. Or if you want semi-simple linear categories, linear functors, and natural transformations between them. And what this does, I take an oriented manifold, which comes with a map to BD. Um, this map just describes my D bundle on X, and I should assign to it a number. So the number I assign to it, I take this co cycle here, I pull it back and I integrate it over X. And then, um, yeah, okay. Um, let me mention also what is the, um, so there should be a line bundle assigned to N minus one dimensional manifold. I'm directly telling you what happens on N minus two dimensional manifold. So to this, I should assign. Uh, by this construction, I should somehow assign to it a job on the field. So I should assign to it a job on D bundle and sigma. And this is the uh, transgression, or it's classified by the transgression to sigma of omega. So this as a category just has one object, one automorphism, and three frogs. And then a map. So this is. Something like a KV2 space. Um, and then the map into it is just described by a two cosine. So I need to give you a two cosine on the space. And this can be done using transgression. I have maps from sigma into D. And for sigma, this maps via evaluation to BD and via projection down. So this is the same as principal D bundles on sigma. This maps to bundles on sigma. And then the transgression of omega to sigma is defined as I pull back. Omega along the um, evaluation map. 
And then I integrate, I push it forward by integrating with the sigma. Okay, and this is then, this is the line bundle which these classical PT will assign to a, a vector space. Okay, then there's the quantum version, which is now just given by summing over CX. So what we want to perform usually is a fast integral. In this case, we can actually do that. So this is one of these. And now that's was what makes this great gauge series so nice. And let's define the partition function as the path integral over bundles, uh, D bundles on X. And then I take the action, which is on this one. And then this integral, if there are only finitely many uh, uh, bundles with a discrete structure group on a compact manifold, this is just a sum. And then one needs to put in some normalization factors, right? Sum over isomorphism classes of uh, D bundles on X. I evaluate my heat series on it, and I divide by the isomorphism of this. So the number of elements in the automorphism group and this group. Right? And then this also needs to assign vector spaces. To n minus one dimensional uh, manifold and two vector spaces to higher uh, to n minus two dimensional manifolds. And this just happens. So let me again only do the n minus two dimensional thing. This is given by taking sections of the FD bundles on X. And this classical B theory defines the jerk over the space and I take sections of the square. This is my this will be a linear category and this is what the theory assigns to it. Okay. Now last few minutes I actually talk can talk about on only symmetries. So these things I'm going to say have been studied in the physics literature by Kapustin and Swangreen and then some of the things I say about boundary series have been studied in a paper by Witten and then a paper by Wang Wen and Witten. So in the symmetry, now it takes another finite group G, which should act on my theory. And it acts classically by acting on the field. So I want to have an action on the stack of D bundles. This is represented by DBD. So I can describe this as a map from G to the automorphism of DD. And as a higher group, this is the automorphisms of D and then DX on this by conjugation. So I call this thing, call this alpha, so this is my action. And then if you space this out, this gives you what's called a non abelian tutor cycle. So this is again equivalent to fixing an extension like this. And this G hat. Somehow tells me how D gate field and G gate fields combine. So they are, they are somehow not independent if I want to put it on, on background manifolds which have a, have a G gate field. This is sometimes called fractionalization of, of symmetries in physics, or that's at least how I, under, I, how I understand the term. Um, okay. And then this is not just an action, but I want this to be a symmetry of the classical field theory. So the condition is that L omega. Is a fixed point uh, for, I mean, this action induces me an action of G on the collection of n dimensional TSPs. And I do once extended once, and then, but still, this fixed point is actually data. So I need to say how it's a fixed point. And if I would do fully extended once, then there would be more data. But in particular, there could also be never be a number of because then the theory would be fully local. And we can use the cobordon hypothesis to always uh, couple to background fields. Um, but this implies that if I look at the Dijkstra-Witten like theory, so the quantized version, then this lives to G representations. Um, this is now a functor which goes to the category of G representation. Uh, and now the Hofstra normally appears uh, when we, so here our background fields are just orientations. And I want to enlarge them with new orientations and um, 
background fields for the symmetry. So I also want to have V bandit as background fields. And now let me first mention a situation where you can do that. So if I can find an omega hat with an N cycle on uh, BDG hat, which pulls back to omega, uh, then I can um, gauge the symmetry. So I want, which means I want to define a field theory defined with these background structures. And what do I do? I take the field theory defined for omega hat. And then if I have a group homomorphism like this, wait. Sorry. Um, if I have a group homomorphism like this, I can push forward field theories along that. So I push this field theory forward along this. Lambda, and this defines for me a field theory on G. And in the Fantoria framework, this has been explicitly defined by, by Schweiger and Volke, for example. Okay, in this case, this, um, so in this situation, there's no anomaly. And the last thing I want to say is about a situation where one has an anomaly. So I can look at a really similar situation. So I might find an omega hat, which pulls back to, to omega, but it's not closed. And then the closed thing is uh, the pullback of something closed on G. So theta is an element in uh, the N plus one in G. Okay. In this case, this omega itself will not define a field theory as omega hat. Because it's not closed. But what it will define for me is the natural transformation from the identity um, to uh, lambda star LC. And now the statement is um, that one can actually perform a relative version of this push forward. So I can take the theory L omega and I can push it forward. It now gives something which goes from one to a theta, so I respect to this uh, n plus epsilon n minus one. And this defines the relative field theory for me. And um, this then, um, so this is field theory relative to this invertible field theory describing the anomaly. The germ describing the anomaly is just a transgression of theta to the space of bundled. Um, and yeah, one can be more explicit on how the Ebert spaces and state spaces look. So that's in my paper with Mitchard. And then one last thing, if one has an anomaly, this is not a big problem in physics, but what one cannot do is gauge. So I, I cannot now sum over G bundles. And this is also what happens here because I cannot, because this L theta is not a pullback of, of a theory on uh, defined on just on oriented manifolds. So I cannot, Perform a push forward, forward to the point, which would be the conservation. Okay, that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Maybe I start with the question. So I suppose uh, here 